Welcome back to another episode of Utilitarianism. Just kidding, it's the Christian version. In the words of Joseph Fletcher, As we shall see, Christian situation ethics has only one norm or principle or law. Call it what you will, that is binding and unexceptionable. Always good and right regardless of circumstances. That is love, the agape of the summary commandment to love God and the neighbour. Everything else without exception, all laws and rules and principles and ideals and norms are only contingent and only if they happen to serve love in any situation. So today we're looking at Situation Ethics by Joseph Fletcher. Uh, the main reading is Situation Ethics by Joseph Fletcher, 1966. In part one, we're looking at love, agape, and the six propositions. In part two, the four working principles and conscience. In part three, application. And part four, criticisms, analyses, and discussion. Don't forget to subscribe to us. We are at the Pan Sidecast. And um, we've got loads of great feedback recently um, from our last podcast. And we're, we're, we're on a home run. This is great. We're enjoying it. Like us. Um, subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a five-star review. Let's go. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> In a world where sex, drugs, rock and roll, the M6 toll are out of control, one man tries to bring Christianity into this mess. He doesn't like rules, but he does not like rules. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Fletcher is the The Love Guru. Hello, I'm Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello. And Mr. Ollie Marley as well. Hello. How are you both? I feel in a very loving mood today, Jack. I can feel the love tonight. (laughs) <laughs> I feel like we're going to make a lot of references to love yeah. songs as this goes on. Yeah, I feel like, you know, over the last few weeks, I've come to realize I love both of you deeply. Should we just ignore that and carry on? Yeah. Well, I I, you know, I put myself out there, put my heart on the line. Anyway, moving swiftly on. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Joseph Fletcher? We're looking at situation ethics today, Joseph Fletcher's situation ethics. So before we jump into part one, we'll give it a bit of context. So who is Joseph Fletcher, Jack, Ollie and Andy? investigates do you want to take this one andy sure thing uh born in 1905 died in 1991 so in the grand scheme of things with the, with the people we've been talking about in the previous podcast very modern um and well he his ethics is built around largely uh in the 1960s which is when his book situation ethics was actually produced um as far as a little bit of background of of who he was he was an ordained episcopalian priest in the united states of america uh and even went to harvard university uh and he specialized in biomedical ethics uh before writing his book uh situation ethics uh, which is actually the you know the title but also the type of ethics that we're discussing today i was gonna say want to know a fun fact about joseph fletcher jack love to he became an atheist before he died oh yeah there's something about humanism here no yeah so there's like a link with humanism so i think joseph fletcher well we'll go into it in a bit more detail but he wasn't just kind of concentrated on Christianity in the end, he actually kind of um, renounced that and became a quite outspoken kind of humanist thinker. Didn't he win well. some sort of award as well, Jack? Humanist of the year. What year was this? Oh, I believe it was in uh, 1974. I oh. didn't even know they gave out humanist of the year awards. Does, does that still happen? What well, for some of our listeners, what is humanism? We haven't used this word yet. Yeah. This is the first time we've used the word humanism. So someone who thinks you can live an ethical and fulfilling life without God is our definition of humanism. Andy, humanism of the, humanist of the year, 2017. I plan on doing a lot of good charitable work, <laughs> mostly favouring me um, <laughs> for myself. <laughs> so I, I'll give myself an award, best Andy, <laughs> not in this place. room. <laughs> can't I can't speak for the others? I'm sure there are a lot of good ones out there. <laughs> okay, so situation ethics, uh, broadly speaking, before we jump into the nitty gritty, what what is situation ethics? What's it getting at, and what's it? 
uh, response to essentially so kind of linking it again i guess with the joke at the start of the podcast um situation ethics is very similar to utilitarianism in a lot of ways um it's a relativist approach to ethics so um situation ethics isn't going to say there's absolute moral laws um they're going to say you should kind of judge your ethics on the uh, outcome of your action and what you should judge it on is doing the most loving thing in any situation but what type of love are we talking about here? Are we talking about sort of erotic love? <laughs> and that's IQ for part one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about erotic love. Part one, Agape and the six propositions. Our inquiry question. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. <laughs> what was that? That was so good. That was so good. I am going to just drop like random just love songs into what we're saying. I'll be uh, like, love, love me do, Andy. Yeah. So what is, what's love? What is love? Good question. I with... mean, I talked about the love I had for you guys, but now that's kind of turned into a searing hate. Let's just pretend <laughs> because, that didn't happen. Uh, Let's just I was it. rejected horribly. But uh, yeah, should we go through some of... Cause the ancient Greeks had a lot of different words for love. You couldn't get away with just one type. That wasn't good enough. Um, so we've talked about agape, but just a quick reminder, Ollie, what is agape? Agape is unconditional love um, for every human being around you. Right, and, and that was obviously kind of picked up by the Christian ethic. What what does it mean really for Christians when we're talking about agape? Good. So um, obviously for Christians, Jesus is very important. And one of his main teachings was love thy neighbor. So this form of love for Christians isn't romantic love. It's kind of like a detached um, mutual, I guess, respect for all human beings. Um, not, I guess, you know, the word love can be a little bit misleading, I think, sometimes. But yeah, kind of like a, a, an unconditional love for all human life that's kind of slightly detached, I would say. And that, that love maybe comes from God. Is that a good way of yes describing jesus it. was god jesus was god and god is love um eros is what jack i have no idea you do you know i don't erotic love oh, okay so, um so it's again not, it's not something i'm familiar with no you're <laughs> celibate uh, i don't know if uh, listeners out there jack is a monk now um sworn to a life of no sex he was which... very persuaded by the uh, ontological argument yeah <laughs> and now it's taken, he's, he read the subtext behind it as well, which meant celibacy. Um, philia, which is friendship. So the, the type of love that you might have for just any of your good friends. Uh, and then we have, I believe I'm going to pronounce this right. Store J. If that's wrong, then someone correct me, uh, which is the type of love that you have for a family. So maybe the, lo the love that a parent might have for a child. Mm -hmm. uh, Ludus, which is a playful type of love. So Ollie, when you're at the bar flirting with all the, the lady fans that, of yours, uh, you know, that might, <laughs> that might, that might be the have, type of love that we're, we're talking about there. And uh, Pragma, which is uh, long-standing love. So the love that maybe uh, an old married couple might have for one another. Why do we not use these words more often? I don't because the Gandhi can't even pronounce them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, on page 15 of uh, <clears throat> Joseph Fletcher's Situation Ethics, I'm going to quote from here. He says, One explanation should be made. The word love is a swampy one, a semantic confusion. Right, so compare these statements. See it now, uncensored. Love in the raw. <laughs> the second one, I just love that hat. Isn't it absolutely divine? The third one, do you promise to love, honour and obey? Number four, oh, come on, just this once, prove your love. Number five, I love strawberries, but they give me a rash. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, so there's, the word love is one that gets thrown around a lot. And ultimately, even just going through the types of love we have, it, I think you do need to have different definitions. Just because you love strawberries, doesn't that's not the same love that you're going to have for your partner, unless... You know, you Your really do. a strawberry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I dated a strawberry for a few years. Uh... <laughs> right. So, uh, when we use the word love, we're referring just the New Testament word agape, the Greek word agape, aren't we? It's just Situ unconditional love. Situation ethics yeah. is, is agape love. Cool. Uh, so just, uh, just to put it in Fletcher's context, 
uh, page 31, why does he use love? And um, this is a famous, famous quote, which you should remember, even if you're not studying the A-level, this is a great quote. Uh, so linking it with utilitarianism, which is for the principle that it's for the, you do things for the greatest happiness, for the greatest number, right? But quote from Fletcher, love is for people, not for principles. So you're doing something for, you know, something worthwhile. It seems ultimately everything's done for love and it's better to do it for some random print, not random principle, for some principle of reason. It's better to do it for love, pure, raw love. Should we give right. a bit of cultural context to maybe what Joseph Fletcher is talking about here? So obviously yep. we're talking about, obviously he's saying that love is what you should base your moral decisions on. So instead of using happiness, like in utilitarianism, um, or just following laws because that's what you should do, he's saying you need to use love as your main kind of um, uh, source for your moral code. Um, and this is quite interesting because Joseph Fletcher's writing in the 1960s, and the 1960s kind of, and especially in America, was a time of very quick kind of cultural change. I mean, you had like the Vietnam War, which was one of the, f- the first televised war, um, and, um, for the American people could actually watch the war, and there was a big protest movement against it, um, kind of like challenging the authorities of like the government and that sort of thing. Um, you had things like the abortion laws coming in, where abortion was now legal, um, the kind of slight decline of capital punishment, you can kind of see that a lot of the kind of uh, legalist, very kind of strict rules that had been in kind of American and I guess British society as well to a certain extent were kind of being challenged and being questioned. And people were going, actually, <clears throat> a lot of these rules don't really relate to the modern world. And it's quite interesting that Andy said that Joseph Lecture was a bio, um, kind of interested in um, bioethics because, you know, a lot of technology, for example, has changed our attitude towards moral behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, contraception changes people's attitudes towards sexual behavior. And um, even with situation ethics, you can kind of see that Joseph Fletcher's, instead of having very strict moral laws, like things like the Ten Commandments, or, you know, there's very strict uh, laws that have been in place, is kind of almost giving morality a bit of breathing room, a bit of a chance to kind of have a think about the actual outcomes of those of those actions and that morality as opposed to just following the laws because you should. Mm-hmm. He's really rejecting that legalism from the Bible, like you say, isn't he? Those, those strict, absolute moral, you know, the Ten Commandments, this kind of thing. Uh, again, he says, laws in the Bible are illuminators, but not directors. So there's a, obviously a massive, like the Catholic Church, let's take that for example. You know, you might take um, things in the Bible to, you know, literally true, like thou shall not kill, you should never kill. You know, in any circumstance, that's a, that's a, a law which you should always follow. But Joseph Fletcher is saying, no, what underpins all the things in the Bible, they're just examples of how to live lovingly. You know, Jesus didn't walk around saying, don't do that, do this. You know, he, he just, he exercised an ethic of, of love and you should follow his way, essentially, he's saying, isn't he? Yeah. And this was culturally, you know, a, a phenomenon. You had like, you know, the 1967 summer of love, which was, you know, not just kind of uh, it was, you know, it was music, art, it was academics like Joseph Fletcher were kind of seen to be kind of part of that movement as well to a certain extent, um, uh, which is quite interesting because philosophers don't really get kind of linked with that, that kind of cultural movement often, really. I um, mean, it's quite interesting that he kind of became very popular through that, through people who probably normally wouldn't have uh, either heard of him, um, which is yeah, quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, should we just, because we're on context at the moment, uh, is it worth going through a couple of the other key people around maybe situationalism in uh, Christian thought? Because, yeah. it, yes, Joseph Fletcher is the main person you'll be referencing when talking about situation ethics, but it would be wrong to suggest that he was the first person to kind of um, popularize this idea or that he wasn't kind of building off the the works of other people. Um, just like most philosophers, there's a background of much talk and discussion before this book gets produced um there are a few people it's probably worth just mentioning a couple though um paul tillich um from so born in 1886 died in 1965 uh, so right around the time that fletcher was doing his best work um he wrote a book called morality and beyond and a quote from there discusses the idea of love and it's uh, the law of love is the ultimate law because it is the negation of law it is the absolute because it concerns everything concrete so he's he's really getting at that idea that love is the ultimate uh, if there's one concrete if there's one absolute law then it's love and everything else has to derive from that fletcher picks that up completely that's the thing that he kind of says as well um, Bishop John Robinson from 19, 
19 to 1983, wrote a book called Honest to God. And in here, he talks about this idea of uh, man come of age, where he argues that human beings have now got to the point where, uh, you know, as rational beings, we are mature enough and we've discovered enough things that we should be able to make our decisions outside of necessarily this dictation of legalism where you have strict laws that are always the case where actually you know human beings are smart enough to make tough choices that aren't requiring uh, some of the things that perhaps the bible says are absolutes those are two but there are plenty of others um worth i would recommend getting a good background of it um because it makes sense that fletcher picks up some of those ideas and, and kind of runs with them cool in the foreword of Situation Ethics, Joseph Fletcher makes something very, very clear, and we should too at the start of this podcast. He explicitly says that it's not a meth, it's Situation Ethics is a method of situation or contextual decision making, but it's not system building. It's, system building has no part in it whatsoever. So again, linking to our joke, utilitarianism is a system built. There's a big system behind utilitarianism full of principles and uh, the head on at calculus, things like this. That's got no part to play in Joseph Fletcher's. So linking back to what we said about Jesus, Jesus didn't have an ethic. He didn't have a systematic ethic. He just did the most loving thing. And Joseph Fletcher saying that's what we should do too. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. We need to focus on Jesus a little thing, a little bit. I think here because this is really important. Um, so Jesus as a person was obviously Jewish. Um, so a lot of the morality in the time that he lived was based on the morality of Judaism. Um, things like the Ten Commandments. Um, and the people that were experts in the Jewish law at this time are called Pharisees. Um, and there's a lot of stories in the New Testament of Jesus being challenged by Pharisees and not, kind of not getting on with them. So, shall we have a look at a Bible story, gentlemen? Would you like me to read you a story from the Bible and we can talk about how Jesus uses situation ethics in the Bible? I think that would be, that'd be really loving yeah, it's of you. <laughs> there's nothing more I'd love more. <laughs> <laughs> Love. You have no agape for us whatsoever, <laughs> or our <Yeah>. listeners. <laughs> Bible. 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 Corner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, and welcome to Bible Corner with me, Ollie Marley. Um, today we're looking at John. Uh, we're on chapter eight. <laughs> today, this isn't going to be a regular <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. Uh, today we're looking at John chapter eight. Okay, so let's go. Um, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down on to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stopped, uh, bent down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. That was beautiful. Thank you for that. That was really lovely. <laughs> so how does Jesus use situation ethics in this story? So that's kind of, it's not the most, I don't think it's the most difficult story to understand in the world, but law of Moses at the time, if you're caught in adultery, um, you are murdered brutally by being stoned to death. Um, that's the law of the country. That's the law of the Jewish people. Um, uh, but Jesus doesn't do that, does he, Andy? What does he do instead? He says that... <sighs> Essentially, if you are without sin, then yes, you can cast judgment. But of course, no human being is without sin and that they are all forced to leave because to throw a stone would be hugely hypocritical of them. Uh, so he kind of twists it round and forces them to accept that actually you're all sinners and she's just made a mistake yeah. and they all leave. And he does, you could argue, the most loving thing. If, if the two options are stone someone to death or don't stone someone to death, not stoning them is probably the most loving thing to do in that situation. The thing is, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because situation ethics could potentially justify stoning someone to death if m enough people found it the most loving thing to do. Bible. 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 Corner. So, uh, do the most loving thing. Do the most... Uh, so, do the most loving thing. Love is agape. We've established that so far, haven't we? 
So in every situation, ask yourself, what will produce the most love? So this is a teleological theory of ethics. They're not interested in the antecedent. They're interested in the consequent. They're not interested in the deontolo- deontology, you know, your motive. All it depends on is that you're doing it to produce the most love, right? So when Ollie comes at me and loves a pineapple at me, Ollie's doing that because he thinks it's going to produce the most love. He's deluded in thinking so, and this is a dreadful example. But as long as he's throwing it with the idea that he's going to produce love, the most love. Is it the most love or just the most loving thing? Can we quantify love? Well, well, that's one of the criticisms of it. But essentially, yes, it, is, it should be quantifiable in the same way that um, like happiness or pleasure is in utilitarianism. It works the same way. Yeah. So there's only one objective universal moral law for Joseph Fletcher, and that's love. Yeah. Right. Ultimately, we do everything for love. Or he observes that fact in the world that love is the best thing or the most sought after thing, and that ethics should aim towards love. Just as, you know, Bentham thought that pain and pleasure govern the world, you know, we should minimize pain and maximize pleasure. Joseph Fletcher thinks we should just maximize love in a sense, doesn't he? Yeah. It's um, the only intrinsic good. He's a big Beatles fan. He's going to say, all you need is love. Love is all you need. It's relative to it. It depends on the circumstance completely, doesn't it? So uh, you shouldn't always do not murder. You know, you should never just do not kill. Sometimes killing might be the most loving thing to do, as we will find out in this podcast. Um, sometimes you can make a case for that. And Joseph Fletcher was a massive supporter of euthanasia and abortion. And he really went against the grain of the church um, in the 60s for this. And it was a big proponent of his work. Um, so linking nicely, just before we look, look, at the, look at the six propositions, can I just give an example which Fletcher gives at this point? Sure. Yeah. So after he's established love in, in his book, he uses a situation. It's quite a serious one, but we'll see how he would respond to it. In 1962, a patient in a state mental hospital was raped by a fellow patient, an unmarried girl ill with radical schizophrenic psychosis. The victim's father, learning what had happened, charged the hospital with culpable negligence and requested that an abortion to end the unwanted pregnancy be performed at once in an early stage of the embryo. The staff and the administrators of the hospital refused to do so on the grounds that the criminal law forbid all abortion except therapeutic ones when the mother's life is at stake. In this very serious and upsetting example, someone's raped in a um, mental health facility by a fellow patient and the father of the person who's been attacked says, you know, I'd like my daughter to have an abortion. And the facility says, no, this is against the, against the law of, of, you know, he's using this example of Christian law. The Catholic Church would, uh, would perhaps forgive this. Would, would they outright say you have to, you can't have an abortion in this case, the Catholic Church? I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I think the Catholic Church, usually the standpoint would be, unless the mother's life is at risk, uh, that even even in cases of rape, um, it would be a greater sin to have an abortion, um, because the, the argument would be that there is some light out of having a child and, and bringing new life into the world. Um, yeah, and there's, there's strong theological basis to reject abortion we've talked about thomas aquinas before and how uh, natural law would typically go against the idea of abortion as well mm-hmm. and the bible has plenty of things to say about it um so yeah usually it's quite quite firm abortion is is a sin but in this case the most loving thing joseph fletcher argues for everybody involved would uh, would if the family and the the woman would would like an abortion then they could have one uh, so that's uh, probably uh, that illuminates situation ethics, I think, as a good example, and hence why he uses it. It's quite an extreme example. Um, but as we will see, as you know, the, unfortunately, these things they do happen in the world. And they, if we, we look at the problem of evil, evil things happen. And Joseph Fletcher is saying, yes, you know, people that are on the receiving end of that shouldn't be, um, I don't want to use the word condemn, but have to face the consequences. Yeah. You know, they, they, they're allowed to be an active, um, prime mover in the world and exert their free will onto it and say look i can change circumstances and exercise love in the way that perhaps jesus would right yeah is that Um, yeah see the controversies jumping out here yeah and i think it's a reaction against that kind of idea of you know just following the law because it's the law sort of thing where if you're following a law just because if you think that no this law is making you do the wrong action or the least loving action there's a frustration there and i think joseph fletcher is kind of identifying that 
the, the laws don't always make you do the right, what he would say the right, most loving thing is. Um, and situation ethics is a way to kind of decide what that thing, that, that moral action should be. Um, while, we're, while we're on this point, um, because I don't think we've actually quite been clear with a couple of key words that you probably want to know. Um, so we've talked about this rejection of legalism. Um, but we have, I don't think we've actually defined this. Um, and there is a, the, the kind of opposite of, uh, so antinomianism, which mm. is, which we also haven't discussed. So should, should we quickly do that before we move on? Cause I yeah, think it's a good, take good point. Andy, do. what is legalism? Legalism is the idea of having a strict moral code, uh, that we're talking absolutes rules that sh- sh- are put in place and should not be broken. And that, you know, that's your typical 10 commandments if you're looking at the Christian ethics. But you could say the legalism in law would just be simply that you know killing is against the law there's no if ands or buts about it um if you're a comic fan judge dread is pretty legalistic <laughs> he is the law and if anyone breaks that law they get judged that's pretty much it in a nutshell yeah so uh and you, there's no there's no moving out of that one antinomianism is the idea of uh so nomos meaning law so it's anti-law or i guess another word would be anarchy um would well that would be at its, its furthest extent if you have anarchy what does that really mean for us ollie anarchism or antinomianism you're looking at no laws no laws at all everyone is in control of their own kind of moral decision making um which um i guess a lot of people kind of romanticize and there is kind of a lot of romanticism based around anarchism but it would literally be a society which is um chaotic out of control Everyone making their own choices um, and having no legal system, no police, no law courts. Got any Every- movie references for this one? Oh, uh, yeah. So if you're into The Purge, maybe. So the idea that in The Purge movie is that all laws are, you can do whatever you want for a day, one day of the year. Um, so that would be a good example of anarchy or antinomianism. Um there's loads of other examples. This is right. quite a common one, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And right, so you got these two extremes there. Either strict absolute moral code or no code at all, and that you can justify almost anything, uh, because you know, nothing will happen as a consequence. Finally then, uh as we've been saying and this the whole ethic that situation ethics is built upon is situationalism, which is that there is so it, situationalism is not that there is no moral code at all. Um, it is about the fact that you have one absolute, in this case, we're talking about love, and that you have to use practical wisdom during times of, like, of moral dilemmas, and you can come to your choices. Um, it does not mean that you can, like, necessarily justify anything. You can only justify something based on the consequence of what creates the most loving outcome. Yeah. And if you look at it in terms of a scale, if it was a line, you'd have antinomianism on one side. You would have um, legalism on the other. There's complete opposites. Situationalism is kind of in the middle. Um, and that's kind of the way that you can either put it in your notes or where you can kind of remember it is that situationalism is not saying there are no laws, but it's not saying we should have complete chaos and no laws at all. It's kind of in between using your love as your main kind of uh, moral system. Perfect. Well, then I think that sums up that part. One, two, three, four, five, six propositions. Right, we're looking at the six propositions. Um, so the six propositions, first of all, the proposition uh, is a suggested scheme or plan or something expressing an opinion. So these are the six ways, I guess, that love can be characterized by Joseph Fletcher. Um, maybe I'll change the word characterize as we look through them. Um, but yeah, they're just bringing to light how what love is and the nature of love and what it's all about. Yeah. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. So the six of them. Should we start with number one? Only one thing is intrinsically good, namely love. Nothing else at all. Boom. We've already talked about this a little bit, haven't we? But let's just unpack that word uh, intrinsically. What what are we talking about? Something's intrinsically good. It's in its nature. So... Um, I remember I explained this to a pupil once and I was like, intrinsic is something that's in your nature, something that you just kind of do. And they were like, oh, sir, does that mean that I intrinsically talk? And I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that is part of your nature. Um, yeah. So in this context, yeah, love is, is absolute good. I guess you could say another word or complete, complete and absolute good. Yeah. It's good. I think, again, we're linking all this stuff back to utilitarianism. We talked a lot about uh, instrumental goods and intrinsic goods. Something is instrumental in that it is only good because it 
gets you something. Um, so the, whereas the intrinsic good is just good in itself. Um, therefore, what you could say is everything else is in, uh, instrumental to that end of love. So you only do something if it produces the most amount of love. Um, and love is the only absolute. Mm-hmm. So in his book, he basically dedicates probably 10 pages each. It's 180 pages of his book and 60 pages of that third of the book. He's dedicated to summing up these six parts. What I've done is I went through and just picked out the main parts, if that's okay, if I just bring them to light. Uh, so straight away he says, it follows that in Christian situation ethics, nothing is worth anything in and of itself. It gains or requires its value only because it happens to help persons. So that idea of agape, all the things that the Bible says to do, you know, they're only good because it helps other people because it promotes love. It's the only principle that always obliges us in conscience. We'll look at conscience again in part three, in part two rather. Um, so when we say that love is always good, what we mean is whatever is loving in any particular situation is good. Love says, do what you can where you are. So it says, you know, in your given situation, what's the most loving thing to do? How can I promote love here and now? Like it's not saying, do not kill in all situations. I don't need some kind of rule like I'm a child. I'm a rational being capable of deciding what promotes love. Yeah. I mean, to be really clear here, so like, so love doesn't necessarily mean that you're just going to be like lovey-dovey nice to every moral situation. Sometimes to do the most loving thing, you might have to do something that you consider quite bad, actually, because mm. that will hopefully create the most love in the long term as opposed to the short term. So don't think of it as just kind of, I'm just going to love everyone and then all crime will go away mm. um, or all, you know, horrible things will stop happening. That's not quite how it works. Um, it's you should be thinking about the most loving, the most love you can create. Um, or the most loving thing to do in a situation. So to get quite serious a second, like the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we, we consider to be, some people think that's the most evil thing, you know, mass killing, you yeah. know, bombing of entire cities. Um, but, th- you know, that's a massively bad thing. I can't put into, into words how bad that seems. But the people who were doing it, the committee that decided that that's what they should do, thought they were doing the most loving thing. They thought it was for the greater love there's a phrase, I'm not sure Fletcher would like that phrase because he's going against utilitarianism, but essentially they thought they could promote more love by killing hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. Um, well, just, I know we're going to talk about it later, but it, this, it, I kind of feel like the discussion has to kind of fit in as a whole because of the, of the way it's done. But in the four working propositions, um, we're talking about pragmatism there, aren't we? They mm. love can't, love isn't just, um, what, like what Ali was suggesting about just loving everybody and, and all that. It, sometimes you have to make tough choices. And in this case, bombing people was the most loving thing to do. Whether or not you agree with that is, is a completely irrelevant really to Fletcher. Yeah, because yeah. they would argue that if World War II had continued even longer, even more innocent people, um, would have died. Whereas obviously those two bombs ended the war pretty much outright. They said the first words were spoken after is the bombing of um, Hiroshima. The first words were, what what in God's name have we done? Um, yeah, so just to wrap up number one. So at the end he says, love and nothing else at all um, is the only intrinsic good. But what follows logically from good being the only, the only, love being the only intrinsic good is malice being the only intrinsic evil. So there has to be an opposite of that. So if you did it in the name of evil, right, evil is also intrinsic as love is intrinsic. It's kind of its... Uh, the binary of it, the opposite of it. Um, but you shouldn't go for that, obviously. You, you get, you're going for love. Because um, Jesus would go for love and didn't go for evil. We're following in Jesus' footsteps. Which yeah. works quite nicely number? for the next one. What's well, the number uh, two? The, uh, <laughs> number two, the ruling norm of Christian decision is love, nothing else. What do we mean by ruling norm? Well, to use Ollie's example previously, I think is the perfect example of that. So the for the, for the Pharisees, the idea of the ruling norm would have just been the the actual written law the code in which they dictate their entire life and action um whereas jesus his only ruling norm was love he he goes against what the the written law says and he uses uh you know for him i guess the most loving and sort of sensible thing to do in the situation yeah there's there's loads of examples in the bible of him being questioned by pharisees by his decisions and the most the most common one and one you can use is when um again he's kind of being tricked they're trying to trap him and they say which is the greatest commandment so they're asking him which one of the ten is the most important um and are probably going to trip him up if he says anything probably apart from love god um but he says that there's two greatest commandments that you can follow which kind of sum up everything to be like a christian i guess or to follow his teaching and that's love god and love your neighbor as you love yourself 
Um, and if you do that, you are fulfilling the law. You are fulfilling all those rules. Cool. And Fletcher keeps quoting those things as, as it goes on. He's, he's using the basis, the Bible, and uh, what Jesus says is the basis of his moral theory. Make that explicit. Um, but he also says how absurd it would be if like the Bible was like a moral code. So he refer- in page 85, he me- references the sacraments, something Oli, uh, Andy tried to trip me up on last episode. <laughs> we had an interview with Daniel Hill, and he asked me what transubstantiation was. Now, um, Fletcher says, how stupid would it be if, you know, if we followed that to the word? Imagine if everyone was starving, you know, and the, uh, whoever's leading the ceremony, the priests, <laughs> yes, the priests, yes, yeah, yes, the yes, priests leading the, priest. the ceremony. <laughs> and, uh, he was like, no, you're all starving, but this bread, you know, it's, it can't be, you know, it's for the sacrament. We're saving it till Sunday. Uh, you can't have any now. And they're just like, please, I'll get paid tomorrow. I'm starving. I will die if you don't give it me. It was like, no, nope, it's for the sacrament. Like, it would be ridiculous if this was the case. But ultimately, what underpins situation ethics is love and doing the most loving thing. And all the things in the Bible only show what good moral decisions look like. It's just examples, you know, underpinning it all is agape. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, just to use another example, there's another Bible story, um, about, um, uh, Jesus' disciples breaking one of the Ten Commandments, which is working on the Sabbath, where they're walking along and they're extremely hungry and haven't eaten. Um, and they actually, they stop in a cornfield and they start eating the corn. And Jesus lets them eat the corn. Um, and again, the Pharisees are like, well, why are you doing this? It's the Sabbath. You're not allowed to farm on the Sabbath. Um, and Jesus says they're exhausted. They're tired. You know, using his situation ethics, he's deciding the most loving thing to do is to let them eat, let them rest. Um, so, yeah, again, there's lots of examples of kind of Jesus not being quite uh, anti-legalism, you could say, anti-legalist. Is it, quite, yeah, is it a quote from Jesus who says uh, Sabbath is for the ma- for man, man is not for the Sabbath? It's either Fletcher or some, some Christian thing. It might, it might have been Jesus. Don't want to put words in his mouth. I mean, essentially, if, if, if that's not a direct quote, I mean, that's typically what, what's being argued there. Well, it's interesting though, because with that one, um, I read there was an argument to me made that essentially the Pharisees have got that wrong anyway. Um, because in the Old Testament, it talks about how, um, the Sabbath day, yes, should be kept holy and it should be, um, but the, the thing that's actually rejected is works that benefit yourself. Um, and that essentially, like if you, if it's for a selfish gain, then yes, you, you can't, um, you can't work on the Sabbath if you want money. But if there, if, if there are a situation comes up where like you need food or something like that, God is not going to be appalled that you are, yeah. uh, going against his word by doing something practical. Yeah. It's funny. It's, my favorite one is, um, when Jesus heals someone with leprosy on the Sabbath and then they have another go at him for that. Like, how could you work? Can you imagine like this guy with leprosy, like come back tomorrow, dying man of leprosy, because we're not allowed to heal people today. It's just like, that'd be ridiculous. Yeah. Number three, love and justice are the same for justice is love distributed, nothing else. Justice, one of those great cardinal virtues, isn't it? What is justice? What is justice? Well, love distributed in this case. But what does that actually mean? Well, it's talking about fairness, about being able to, again, going back to utilitarianism, um, kind of giving the most amount of love for the most amount of people um, in, in a sort of practical manner. Cool. So just as concerned with giving everyone their due, isn't it? It's concerned with the neighbor. It's, it's kind of a good ethical theory. We've mentioned this before and, um, Peter Singer's a big fan of this. It's like that third, uh, third person view on the world. You take yourself out to be equal, to treat everyone equally. You have to take yourself out of the picture because ultimately you're not treating people equally if you preference your own preferences over other people's. So if you're going to promote love and take everyone's into consideration, you need to promote it for everybody. And justice will be served if you do it for everybody and not for your own love. Yeah. yeah. God's justice is ultimately loving, Christians believe. So therefore, your justice should be ultimately loving. Cool. Number four. Love wills the neighbor is good, whether you like him or not. I like that one. Why do you like that one? Well, no, just because I just like the idea that I mean, uh, it's actually funny when you talk th- about this to uh, particularly younger students, whether we like him or not. Yeah, we, we, where like you you say, what well, it's just the classic Good Samaritan story, isn't it? And some some people just can't accept like, no, if if I don't like someone, I'm not going to help yeah. them. And you just think teaching to love your enemies is just a hilarious <laughs> teaching because Jesus argues that it's a lot easier to love the people you are fond of, your friends and your family, but loving your enemies takes real kind of spiritual fiber so to speak yeah i mean it, this is this is really what agape is about because it's easy to love and care for the people that you actually like um but you have to extend that to everyone 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it's true agape, isn't it? Love hasn't got any favorites. You can't pick and choose who's going to have their love maximized. You know, you've got a agape by definition of agape, loving your neighbor. Your neighbor is not just the person next door, but Donald Trump across the ocean. You've got to love everybody. Yeah. And it's, that's, that's the tough bit. I think, yeah, because people often look at this and go, well, doing the most loving thing, that's kind of easy. Um, but yeah, you've got to do it for everyone. Um, especially well, the people that really, really annoy you. Um, did, and that's hard. That was, Disconnected to the Donald Trump. We have no political views on the pan <clears throat> uh, Vote Trump. <laughs> we love Trump. <laughs> Agape. We love everybody. We love everybody. And Joseph uh, Fletcher does I too. Don't. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just cut that out. <laughs> we yeah. love everybody. <laughs> we too. can love you too, pan <laughs> Right. Number five. Only the end justifies the means. Nothing else. This is teleology. So, wait. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry. What's teleology? Um, so the idea that everything is moving towards a purpose um, and an end goal. So the target that the arrow is moving towards, we've said this loads of times before in our previous episodes. What's the target for Joseph the, Fletcher? The target for Joseph Fletcher is... Well, it's just, just the most loving yeah, thing. The most I mean, loving that's thing, that's yeah. the end result. And yeah. why do that? Well, I guess, I mean, it would be, well, you're not doing it for the reward of heaven, but I guess that ultimately just is for love. It's in the name of love, in, uh, but because God is love. Uh, yeah. it's, it's done for God. Um, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this quite a lot. Obviously, someone like Kant's gonna be very frustrated with this idea. Um, but it's kind of, I, I would argue this idea is quite common with most people today. I think if you yeah. ask somebody, um, what do you think about ethics? It, most of the time they'll say it has to usually come to some sort of ends justify the means. Cool. Um, and the final one. Love's decisions are made situationally, not prescriptively. What's this getting at? Yeah, so this kind of connects with the previous one. But yeah, so the idea that you're not making a decision just following like a rule just because that's the rule to follow. Yeah. Not prescript. That's what prescri- yeah, prescriptively means when you're just doing it because it's been prescribed. Mm-hmm. Um, you're doing it because in that situation it is the 100% most loving thing to do. And that might change. Yeah. Um, doing the most loving thing in one situation, you could have a, com- if you're in a different situation, the result is going to be different. It's not just one universal law of just, you know, um, forgive everybody, um, for what they've done or, you know, give them a hug. Um, it's going to depend on the situation and what they've yeah, done. You shouldn't always give people a hug. No. You shouldn't have the prescription hug because, people because you no. would never. Yeah. yeah, that's where I've gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. Because in some situations that might be very useful, but in others, not very useful. Good. Um, yeah, so it's all down to that relativism of uh, situation ethics. It seems like, so with those are the six propositions in all their glory, all their loving glory, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no one going there. In all their loving what, Jack? <laughs> right. So just to get meta on, onto the, onto the book itself, situation ethics, because I didn't read it, but I had to slave through large portions of it. And, um, what we'll say is, I don't recommend reading it. <laughs> Although, which is, which sounds Jack like, hasn't got a whole lot of love it, for situation <laughs> ethics. <laughs> Although it goes, oh, it goes over. This is a small book review. If you're wondering what's about to happen, <laughs> welcome to Jack's book reviews. <laughs> so it, it, it uses, it goes over the same points over and over again, just to echo them. And it seems like we might have done that already on, on this already, like 50 minutes into the show. But I'm thinking they're just saying the same thing over again. I get it. Jack, Ollie, and Andy, just do the most loving thing. You don't need to go into all these details. I will aim to a, towards the most loving thing. You don't need to write 180 pages on it. But Joseph Fletcher has, and if you are going to look at it, I recommend looking at the each individual chapter, the opening and the closing, because he just sums it up there quite nicely. There's a lot of exclamation marks to get your enthusiasm going. Before we move into part two, where we're looking at the four working principles and conscience, what do we think of, let's just sum up our thoughts on the six propositions and agape, you know, just do the most loving thing and it, love is intrinsic, it's for its own end, justice, all this jazz. What do you guys think? What are your thoughts on this as we're at this point? So if we're summing up everything we've done, so we've looked at different kinds of love. We've identified situation ethics, which is doing the most loving thing in a situation using agape love, which is unconditional love for all human beings. Um, and obviously Fletcher's given out his six principles of kind of guidelines to help you make your relativist decision. That decision will be different depending on the situation you're in. Uh, my thoughts on that are, I like, I like, I, I think I like Joseph Fletcher's intention, the situation ethics. I think I like what he's trying to do. I think when we obviously get onto the criticisms, quantifying love is my kind of biggest 
problem with the ethical system. I think that's very, very difficult to do. Um, um, but generally, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I agree with relativism. I agree that every situation is different. And I think that, you know, if I was, if I was alive in the 1960s and I was reading this, you know, it, it probably would have reflected a lot of the views that I hold that ha would not have been reflected by like you know, the government or the current kind of political system, I guess. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. Jesus didn't care about the laws of the land, really, did he? He didn't care yeah. about um, legalism. He was all about this ethic, and that's what Joseph Fletcher is really going yeah. for. What are your uh, thoughts? Uh, on? Yeah, go on, Andy. Well, I mean, I think yeah, Jesus did feel that way somewhat, but he he Jesus does prescribe ideas. I mean, Jesus is supposed to be God, um, and therefore to say that Jesus completely just goes down the route of saying most loving thing uh, in any given situation, I'm not quite sure if that's necessarily true. He does have views on things like marriage and 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 sex and and how to treat people and there rock and is, roll and <laughs> and rock and roll. Uh, yeah, and the. To say that Jesus would have just justified anything like, as a means to an end, I'm not convinced that's actually fully recognized in the Bible. What about the idea that love's underpinning everything, though? So he's saying that everything Jesus does is just him trying to promote love. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, I guess that's potentially true. I, I think when we were looking at the problem of evil um, a couple episodes ago, it raises issues, though, about Oh, sure. Uh, if, lo if love is supposed to be the ultimate aim, but is, is everyone capable of that? Of, you know, original sin makes it very difficult potentially to love. And, uh, and that is it loving to punish people for eternity for not fulfilling this standard? Um, I don't know. Is, I, love is within Christianity, but there's, there's a quite strong, um, punishment as well. She loves you, yeah, part two. Part two, the four working principles and conscience. Our inquiry question, what the hell are the four working principles and what is conscience's role in situation ethics? Right, let's jump on the four working principles. They're pragmatism, relativism, positivism and personalism. There they are, write them down. Let's <laughs> 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 now you know them on, let's move on to the next issue. <laughs> no, let's start off Can't with say we don't pragmatism. <laughs> Right, pragmatism, Andy. What is pragmatism? We have already mentioned this a couple of times. Pragmatism, the idea of it has to be practical. It has to actually work in given situations rather than being entirely theoretical or uh, impractical in any s sort of case. Um, so somebody give me how we can apply it in the idea of something of being pragmatic. Um, so, so, right, so you come up with a theory, right, or an idea or a concept and it has to work in practice. Sure. Right. Um, so I'm faced with an ethical scenario, like um, let's say that blah, 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 I'm hungry and I see KFC have a great deal on. They've got a Wicked Zinger Fries, which is now only 99p. Um, but I think although I'm doing the right thing, the most loving thing, and not eating meat and not uh, you know uh, supporting the cage chicken empire, um I won't, I'm, I'm faced with an ethical dilemma, I'm hungry, but if I buy the chips, then I'm going to do something negative there, right? Because I'm going to support them further by buying the chips, and they can put that money into caging hens, chickens. Um, right, so my ethical decision has to be pragmatic. What I do in practice, I've got the idea I shouldn't buy the chips and it will do this. It has to be pragmatic. In reality, if I don't buy the chips, it has to do that. You know, if... Something's wrong. Something has to be wrong with the theory. There's an idea that what's right in theory will always work in practice. Kant's wrote a lot about this. Uh, the, again, I think these essays are entitled Against the Common Criticism that what does work in theory will not work in practice. Well, Joseph Fletcher's grabbing that by the, the chicken and saying, look, you need to make sure this is the case. You need to make sure your theory stands up. The, your ethical decision is going to stand up and it will stand up if it's pragmatic. Yeah. So like if you, for that particular slightly longer example you could just say you could either not buy the chips but uh, to approach that un unpragmatically would be like i'm just gonna bankrupt kfc somehow like it's unrealistic and probably quite impossible cool um so yeah relativism right uh sorry just to mention jill Ol jill oliphant we've mentioned her before yeah. she wrote an, an old ocr textbook um i'm gonna criticize her here so if you're listening jill then uh get ready for this 
Uh, she says in uh, situation ethics she says words like always never and absolute are rejected by situation ethics all right because it's purely relative um but i think this is wrong because uh, joseph fletcher makes it explicit that there's one absolute universal uh, moral law moral uh, maxim that we should always follow and that's love that's always an absolute so they're not entirely rejected there's just one there's one absolute and then you apply that relative to the circumstance but everything else is rejected apart from love. I mean, I, I suspect that she knows that, Jack. Mm. No? <laughs> Stop being nasty to Jill, all right? <laughs> Sorry, Jill. I'm sure you know it. And if you don't, you do now. <laughs> Wait, I'm Jake Symes. I've got a podcast. <laughs> Jill Oliphant, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can we leave that? In? Yeah, I'm sure. Don't leave that in. I'm sure. Please don't leave in. that in. That's the most loving thing. It feel like that's that's agape no, right there. You don't have to just publicly criticize her on a podcast. We which, criticize all no. other people. That's fine. We're yeah, happy I think to. It's, it's fine. I think it's, it's just. I mean, maybe it's just the way it's described yeah. in the book. But I think you know, she knows. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So, so maybe you just didn't me? read it right, Jack. There's a criticism of you. <laughs> what's relative mean? <laughs> what's this idea of relative? Let's just let's just sum it up in a out. sentence. <laughs> What is relativism? Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. It is about the uh, applying something across, a, like it could be a different culture, a different time, um, or with a different group of people. Whatever the case is, is that it can't, you can't have a strict, like always, um, answerable fact. It's just things will change within the context they're in. Cool. Positivism. Another one of the four working principles. Now, this one's a bit of an odd one because you've, I think a lot of people, when they've come across positivism, probably have heard of logical positivism, um, mm. which, you know, championed by people like Bertrand Russell, uh, who are going to make claims about things like, um, you know, if it, if it's not a verifiable uh, empirical fact, uh, then it's basically a pointless statement. And, and so usually when we're talking about positivism, we'll say if something is empirical and we can judge it, then it's, considered truth um in the case of fletcher though what's what's he getting at here just that value judgments need to be made and love always comes first well yeah so the he, with him he he makes the distinction um and said yes the, there is a, a you know a fact value gap um but you have to kind of take a leap of faith in in the idea that god is love um and that once you kind of have that basis um, you, you have to follow that as your truth. Um, so there is an element of faith to it. I think you could argue and say, well, if you kind of reject that idea, then it doesn't really hold. But he says that, well, it's, it's still Christianity. You have to take a bit of a leap. The fourth and final uh, working principle is personalism. So people-centered. So your um, situation, ethical decisions should be based on people. And your love is completely based on people. And that comes before the laws themselves. Mm -hmm. So obviously you could argue a lot of laws um, aren't necessarily people focused. Um, and I think Joseph Fletcher probably would be quite frustrated with those laws, if they, especially if they get in the way or hinder um, people from doing the most loving thing. So yeah. he's saying that all laws should be, or all your, your ethical decision making should be focused on people. Yeah. Um, and that can be quite interesting as well when we get into the criticisms as well, because some people could definitely argue that not always um, having been people focused might not always be the best idea but yeah I mean I much prefer stuff over people <laughs> if I could have like just the biggest house with all the nice things but you two had to kind of just I don't know well, go someone somewhere. might argue I don't know well I guess long term like the planet maybe yeah and um but he's getting and really Andy just wants lots of stuff. Please send him. Yeah, if you could you, just, just, I'm going to set up a nice stuff. PO box, um, and <laughs> you could just send me things. Now, if it's not nice, then I'll find you. But uh... <laughs> but what he's getting at here is just to get back on track. <laughs> what he's getting at here is uh, like you say, Ollie. It's um, you know, laws. There might be four people. But you shouldn't do things for the sake of a law. I think this is where he's saying Kant's got it wrong. You know, when the murderer knocks at the door yeah. and you do not lie and you do not lie because um, it seems that you should always not lie and you're doing it for the principle, the maxim alone. He's saying that's where Kant's got it wrong. He's, he's missed the, he's missed the point of what he set out to do, which is ultimately for people. You know, Kant's big on agency, rationality, um, dignity, autonomy, all those things. Look at our early episode. Is it episode five on Kant? Possibly. But, um, just to quickly interject there, surely Kant has a defense of just saying, no, it, it is for people. Yeah. Um, it's entirely based around people. Um, it's just, 
but if somebody else doesn't hold up their end of the bargain, I guess, then mm-hmm. it's, uh, you still have to play your role. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe you can say, well, that goes back to is that's not pragmatic. Well, yeah, I th- just not to go on a detour, but I think what underpins can ultimately is autonomy. Like we say, I think there's a lot of people, we've mentioned this just to refer back to our old Kant episode. A lot of people think that you can't, Kant would lie to the person at the door. And when he was, he's got, so Kant's got two parts of his ethics, hasn't he? The pure side, which we've done podcasts on and the practical pragmatic side, which actually says sometimes you have to get your hands dirty. Sometimes you have to lie. And ultimately that protects autonomy. But the difference is Joseph Fletcher, wants to protect love and promote love you know they're not very they're just two observations or things they're trying to protect in their theory aren't they would um, Kant put people first would you say he was personal would you use personalism yeah yeah because the whole- i mean he would argue that as as a rational being um that because you retain that dignity and therefore every other rational being does so as well you have to protect the rights of people So they're the four working principles, and this is what underpins situation ethics. You have to have these presuppositions. So he calls them some presuppositions, this is chapter two, and then he just has four working principles. So by some, he just means four, and there are four of them, and those are them. So you need, these things need to be there for situation ethics to work. If you're not going to support relativism, if you're not going to be positivist, if you're not going to be pragmatic or personalist, then, you know, you may as well just not bother just go away. <laughs> just, just go not be ethical. If, if you feel like that applied to you, stop listening right now. And, <laughs> and I would you know, heavily suggest you unsubscribe. Always let Always your let conscience your be conscience your guide. Your guide. La, 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 la. Conscience and its role in situation ethics. What's, what's the gist with conscience? Getting our old friend Jiminy Cricket back on board here. What, what is conscience? It's a little cricket on your shoulder that tells you to do stuff. To help you become a real boy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you have that, Jack? No. Oh, well, you missed out. out yeah, yeah. I talk to Jiminy all the time. It's yeah. great. Um, <laughs> actual theories of conscience outside of the realm of Pinocchio um, are far more well-respected. <laughs> or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can decide. <laughs> yeah, actually, Joseph Fletcher doesn't need to think so. <laughs> So there's four, there's four major theories of conscience, which Fletcher looks at. Um, he says intuition, you know, it's just intuition that your conscience when yeah. uh, a homeless person on the street, your intuition says, I should give that person money, right? You never, your intuition never says kick that person while they're down. You know, it's just intuition. Um, another one, Holy Spirit. Some people think it's the Holy Spirit doing a little dance in your head and God's telling you what's right or wrong all the time. Um, but Fletcher doesn't think that's right either. Introjection, you know, our values of, this is a popular one, values and culture of society. You know, we think that, um, our conscience tells us when mom tells you not to throw a pineapple at your brother, you know, later on in life, when you hold a pineapple and that person's annoying you, that little part of your head remembers it. You know, it's behaviorist or your culture tells you not to drown tells you not to drown i've never drowned anything <laughs> yeah our culture tells us not to drown orphans right it would be a bad thing to drown an orphan that's sure. a horrendous thing to do Damn right greedy orphans and our, our conscience says you know the culture and mom and dad told you not to do that so don't do it okay. and then there's the aquinas one which you've just okay. aquinas's view on the conscience is uh was well, somewhat complex but it's it's built up upon two particular things um so you have the syndesis and the consentia um i believe that's how you pronounce it again feel free to correct me if i am wrong um the which i'm sure you will (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) um so the syndesis when we've talked about natural law the the syndesis principle is the do good uh, uh, so seek good and avoid evil um but i suppose it's slightly more in in and developed when we're talking about the idea of conscience, um, because it's it's about using practical wisdom and almost building up a good bank of knowledge of uh, how to use them in practical situations. Um, and the idea is is that if you use prudence, which is one of the cardinal virtues, which is simply just being able to well, essentially prudence is practical wisdom. It's about being able to determine what to do in any given situation. Um, that by practicing that virtue, uh, you'll build up a good knowledge of what to do. Um, and for Aquinas, this would be aiming towards your telos. The consensus is the actual practical 
use of that information. So you got, you almost imagine that you have like a bank of things that you, you know, mm -hmm. and then the other, the other half of the conscience is actually essentially practically using that, uh, to be able to act. So Aquinas does not have this idea of it just being this God given voice, um, directed to you. It is about the, the faculty of reasoning and being able to apply it properly. Cool. Interesting. You said Aquinas's view on the conscience then. You know, you're treating conscience as a noun, right? And Fletcher. Yeah explicitly rejects all four of those ideas he explicitly rejects his idea of conscience he says the mistake the error is treating conscience as a noun rather than a verb conscience is just making decisions creatively constructively fittingly it's just making the decision that's what conscience is, is this yeah right? it's not yeah it's not a feeling that you have or anything like that it's just what you do when you're making a practical choice yeah so i walk down the street i see someone homeless and i think i should give that person uh, money. You know, I should give them charity. I should do something good. I should buy them a sandwich, right? There's that's conscience. That 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 that's all it is. It's just making that decision. It's just the observation, then the value judgment, then thinking oh, I can do something. It's just making those decisions. There's not something in the back of my head. Jeremy Jeremy Cricket. What's his name? Jimmy. You've never Jim, heard of no, Jiminy Cricket. Pinocchio. Oh my lord. What, um, Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket. You've never. You must have seen Jiminy, Jiminy Cricket in a picture. Like yeah, little, I've seen him in a picture. A Jiminy Cricket. So he's a character from Pinocchio. Who Pinocchio is made out of wood. He's a <laughs> yeah, I get the face. Yeah, well, you haven't heard of Jiminy Cricket, so I'm going to break it down for you. Yeah, and he wants to, and he wants to be a real boy, and obviously he doesn't have a conscience because he's made out of wood. So and his he, conscience is a character who's a cricket called Jiminy Cricket. Who right, tells him okay. to do the right thing. So when he does the naughty thing, like smoking and stuff, he tells him not to do it. He smokes. Yes, Pinocchio smokes. He becomes a donkey at one point. Really? Yeah. Holy hell! You need to watch the. He's seen by a whale as well. Okay, so when no, I see a homeless no, person, no biblical reference there. G Jiminy Cricket's just—he's not on my shoulder telling me to do something. God's not in my head yeah. telling me what's right and wrong. It's just the act of making decisions. Yeah, and I think, but it's important to note that because you you talked about the idea of you know, going through this practical uh, reasoning thing before you make the decision, but it is about actually acting upon that as well there's no good in walking past the homeless person thinking that would be the most loving thing to do and then not to do it that's not conscience obviously so so that's the whole that's conscience and it? it's making a decision and it's all about um again it's all about the consequent it's all about you using conscience to look at how you can so you you make an observation you think how can i do the most loving thing that's conscience at play um but your your conscience he's saying should be directed towards the teleological end of promoting the greatest love actually the most love. you said you had a quote i have a quote now well, that might it. actually sum it up quite nicely from saint augustine our good friend uh which is a good friend <laughs> he's my <laughs> well, we've, we've we've talked about him enough for to for him to feel He's like called Augustine Bay. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the first time it's ever. <laughs> nah. Okay. If it is. He'd love it. He would. <laughs> and anyway, the quote is as follows. Uh, love her with care. And then what you will do. What that means. Well, it just simply means that. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not know what that means? <laughs> love is care. No, love with care. And then what you will do. So if you like think about what's the most loving thing. Yeah. And then do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that quote is. Yeah. yeah but okay. it just summarizes it quite it's, like, that's oh, quite that's pithy, isn't it? Yeah. 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 That yeah. is conscience. Yeah. yeah. I, I get it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Pop Tarts on Toast. That was a slam dunk of an episode. I sure am pan psyched to talk to my orthodox Catholic grandparents about how I can use condoms now. I'm just going to text Bay letting her know. Actually, I might wait until I've heard part 2 for the analysis and discussion. Next Monday can't come quick enough. A subscriber, a 5 star review and a horse walk into a bar. The barman turns to the reviewer and the subscriber. Drinks are on the house for you two lovely humans. He then turns to the horse. Why the long face?